boy, everybody's so quiet. Filters put a, a kibosh on the conversation. got 12.30, so why don't we get started? Good afternoon, S&P. Good afternoon. Welcome to week six. As I've mentioned a couple of times, here we are on the syllabus. We're on October uh, 5th, and we're coming up on an exam, right? So we have an exam, and you're all pros at that now, but I'll present to you today, and again, one more time on Wednesday, just what to think about for the exam. Remember that these are cumulative. It's about the exam. These are cumulative. But the majority of the material is going to be from our last exam, which was uh, the material that has transpired since our last exam. Our last exam was on September 18th, and these are some of the topics that we've covered. We'll finish off our conversation today on color vision, and for Wednesday, we'll move into form perception, okay? And then we'll have all of that as content for Friday's exam, which will be the same format as the last section exam, and also as the next two section exams, so nothing um, particularly new there. Remember that it's headed is our friend for helping us prepare for all of that because then this is summarize what's going on in the PowerPoints, which are the basis for the videos. Okay? And all of that is based on the reading. So I think TED-Ed makes maybe the, the, the best consolidation of all that material. And there's a lot of material there. Okay? Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. I wonder if we might do this. Usually I start out with a bit of review, and I would like to review uh, some of the concepts that we had on Friday. Also, um, I'm grateful to both of our Rachels over the last two Fridays. We had Rachel Fenton this most recent Friday, and then Rachel Reed the Friday before that. One was live, one was by Skype, but it was really nice to have them come and interact with us. And thank you all for your good questions. I think that they, they enjoyed interacting with you. Okay, so before we get into our conversation on color vision and what you were doing with TED-Ed, I wonder if we might do a couple of demos. Some of you have seen demos like this before, maybe in other classes. I'm going to turn the lights down so we get really nice contrast here. But I think these make a couple of great points about color, and maybe they also make some nice points more generally about things like lateral inhibition, an important concept in all of neuroscience and, and psychology as well. Okay, so we'll do a couple of color illusions. Okay, I'll try not to lead the witness here. Here's something like a pin cushion, and here's something like another pin cushion. So we have two pin cushions. You might be able to tell that there's a small black dot there, and there's a small black dot there. Can people see that? Small black dot, is that visible? I can't always tell how. I'm very familiar with these slides because I've been using this one for a few years now. Okay, so I'm going to try not to lead the witness. If I asked you to think about the small patch, on which that dot is placed. Could you tell me the color of that patch? How would you describe it? Yell it out. Green, okay. We're pretty comfortable that's the green. <clears throat> and how about that one? With the color of that patch? Orange, okay. And as you might imagine, those two are physically identical. Right? So they look uh, perceptually quite different. This is a greenish color that's an orangish color. Okay? Right? But if we take advantage of the miracle of PowerPoint and we now superimpose an index card over this that has a hole cut out right here and a hole cut out right here so that we don't get any of the contextual cues, we just get that one stimulus, we get this kind of a thing. Okay? So there that is and there that is. Now how do they both look? What color would you describe this one as? Maybe brown, okay. Do they look similar to you? Okay. And then we'll take that away. Okay. I find that really quite striking, that this is what's hitting your retina in both cases. This is the distal stimulus, and as close as the photographers and artists could make those two in their reproductions of that particular patch, this is actually the same stimulus in the two cases, but looking really quite perceptually different. 
Okay? So pretty cool, and I think a pretty salient demonstration of this simultaneous color contrast. We call it simultaneous color contrast because what's going on here is at a given moment in time, these surrounding colors are influencing that color. Okay? These surrounding colors are influencing that. It's all happening at, at one time. You take that away, oops, you take that away and we get um, the, the idea that these are physically identical. So I find that to be a, a pretty salient perceptual effect. How many people got that? Yeah, okay. Uh, I like that a lot because it's so salient. Uh, there's another one that I like better and that's the one that's coming up here. This is probably my, my second or third favorite demo of, of the semester and students typically like this one a whole lot. So let's, let's tell you how we're going to do this. I don't think I've, I've done this with anybody in the room before, but you may have seen me do this uh, once before. So what I'm going to ask you to do in just a moment is a simple adaptation. We're going to ask you to look at that central fixation cross, maybe for uh, 30 seconds or so. And we're going to have these different shapes. There's something like a stop sign, a circle, a square, and a triangle in the four quadrants. Okay, And that's all white or broad band. Okay? Then what we're going to do is uh, in, in a moment we'll have you um, adapt to those shapes, but those shapes are going to become colored. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to turn that stop sign a particular color and the circle a particular color. We'll have you adapt for a while, and then we're going to bring this back, and then we're going to move the fixation cross right here. It's in the center. At some point after that, it will go all the way up, then back to the center, then all the way down and back to the center. Okay. So what I'd like you to do for maybe the next 30 seconds is simply adapt to this. So those are the colors. Please keep your eye on the central cross, and I'll mentally keep track of about 30 seconds. Actually, I'll use my watch for that. You can blink as you like, but try not to move your eyes fixation off of that cross. We'll go for about 10 more seconds so we get a really good adaptation. And when I bring this, um, I'll, I'll bring back the white stimuli as you're fixating that cross, please continue to do so. Okay? And then I'll ask you to move your eyes up and back to the center, down and back to the center. Okay? So keeping your eyes on that cross, okay? here come the pure white stimuli. Okay? Let's all go up, way up top. Are the whites back? Okay, now here are the pastels back. Okay, let's go down to the bottom. The whites are there. Let's go back to the middle. Are the pastels there? Okay. <laughs> All right. Just to show you the no, no funny stuff up my sleeve, I will now show you all of my cards, right? So these are all the cards in my deck, right? You saw this. You saw that. You saw that, that, that. So I, I told you what was going to happen here. You adapted to this one. And then I just brought you back to a duplicate of this. This I copied and pasted here. And then I pasted another one here, but moved the fixation cross up. Okay? And back down to the center and back over to here. Okay? All right, so why don't you tell me what you experienced? Oh, you can even get it like this. If you keep your eye in the center there, just for keep your eye right over here. Okay? We'll go to five, five, four, three, two, one. Isn't it weird? Like you get this little pastel splash and it goes away fairly quickly. All right? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right, comments. But on, on what you experienced. And we want to describe it? Okay, thanks. I think while we were staring at her, we were getting adapting to the colors. Uh-huh. Mine was in kind of blur a little on the side, like seeing the purple and the orange and the blue around. While you were adapting? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I wasn't aware of that, but okay, that's fine. Okay. All right. So does anybody remember from the color opponent ganglion cells, or the color opponent LGN cells, how they were paired. There were a couple of uh, color opponent pairs. Yeah, how did that go? Uh, red, green, and blue, yellow. Okay, red, green was one pair, and blue, yellow was another pair. And blue, yellow, interestingly, is the phylogenetically older, the genetically older system. Red, green is a little bit more recent. Some of our friends, like Sam and Dalton, those were the monkey friends, the squirrel monkeys that we saw in the beginning of Friday's session when we were taking a look at Jay and Knight's lab uh, by video. They were trying to get that one monkey to become trichromatic. You're trichromatic, or at least most of you probably are trichromatic. And so we have a red-green axis, we have a blue-yellow axis. Now, what's a little bit strange about that is we call them blue-yellow, red-green. I will show you that maybe you won't agree with exactly those labels. So um, if we have you focusing here, okay, 
and we have you basically adapting to this, I'll call it a yellow stimulus, even though that's the vulgar for that, right? That stimulus is actually about 590 nanometers, which you experience psychologically as yellow. It's opposite, according to what Melanie just called out, is opposite would be not yellow, but yellow is paired with blue, okay? So hopefully you'll see something roughly bluish there. Conversely, you'll see something roughly yellowish here. But I'll just give you a warning. You might not agree that that's a really good yellow or a really good blue, okay? So keep your eye on the center there, okay? And that stop sign, which for the moment is yellow, you probably won't call the after effect blue. Here we go. But you might have seen it has a, like a, a bluish tinge to it, okay? Of course, these things are all watered down because they're, they're pastels and they have broadband light. Conversely, that blue square should be turning a little bit on the yellow slot side. Yeah, you're getting something like that, okay? And this is how we're trying to demonstrate to you that inside of your LGN, there really is something that I will very crudely call blue-yellow opponency. Somebody who's a visual physiologist would be able to, to measure the exact wavelengths and say, well, it's, you know, we, we call it yellow, but it's really about 580 nanometers, or, and they would give you a nanometer description. To a first approximation, that's blue-yellow. Let's now do the other diagonal, okay? This guy in after effect should be turning what color? And this one in after effect should be turning what color? Okay, so we'll see. And they're not going to be really good greens and reds, but they'll be pastel equivalents of those. So if you'll adapt just for a moment at that center, and while you're adapting, we'll ask you to draw your attention to the upper left circle, which is for the moment red. You might get a slight greenish tinge there. We'll do that again. Okay. And then maybe that lime green, which isn't, you know, it's not a really good Kelly green, but it's a lime green, will give you something maybe toward the pinker end the spectrum. Is that working for you? Okay. I'm going to start out teaching this course. I would say, you know, red, red, green, blue, yellow, and somebody say, oh, that's not, you know, that's not giving me a red. It's giving me a pink. But you get the idea. We're we're flushing the whole thing out with, um, with these broadband colors. It's going to make everything pastel. Okay. Oh, yes, please. When you're looking at it, what does it mean if like some, the whole shape like just disappears? Ah, okay. Yeah. There's um, the really interesting. Um, demos that we might get to later on, where uh, your, your retina has something called a nystigmus. It actually shakes deliberately all the time so that you can keep an image alive on it. But if, the Im if, you, if, you, station if you stabilize your eye for a while, the image will fade. And the thinking about that is that your retina probably needs to be spending most of its time, if you will, on what is new out there. If something is, uh, has been on your retina for three or four seconds and it hasn't killed you yet, <laughs> okay. Uh, then maybe it's not so evolutionarily important. Is, is one of the and, and we don't typically stare so uh, firmly at any one item for 30 seconds in a row out in the wild, but you do inside of a psychophysical lab. Okay. Then there was this other thing, right? I put up the white slides, and then all I did was I leave the the white stimuli there, but I moved the fixation cross. It went up, then it went back down to the center, then it went down, and then it went back to the center. Okay? And when it was in the center, you experienced the pastels again, but it was in a different location, you didn't experience the pastels. Can somebody help us out with what's cooking there? And why would that be the case? Anybody have an idea about that? Okay, yeah, thanks. So I think it would be something like because situation is no specific location and uh, you see like the like the opposing color um, if you move the location then you're I mean you're you no longer have a opponency. Okay. Okay, very nicely explained, right? So it is the case that you're actually adapting a particular patch on your retina. A couple of facts. Who remembers hearing about the facts of light? One of them being that light travels in straight lines. Okay? So because light is traveling in straight lines and you've got a fixed fixation for some extended period of time, Zach is correct that what you're really doing is you're driving a particular patch on the retina. So this is now going to actually transmit to my... Uh, the left side of, of each of my eyes, right? That, that stop sign that's yellow in color is going to land on the left side of my eyes and it's going to be positioned there for some extended period of time. And we're going to get some fatigue, as Meg was beginning to describe, in the cells that are responding to that. And also, not only responding to that region of space, but also picking up that long, long wavelength. Okay? So they're going to begin to fatigue. Now that's happening at a very particular patch on the retina. I'll use my hand here, just like this. Maybe it's hitting, hitting me right, right like that. Okay? 
Then when I move the fixation cross up or down, you're going to move your eye up or down. But light is still traveling in straight lines. So instead of hitting me right there, I move my, my hand up like that, my eye up like that, if you will. And I hit that way. When I move my eye down, I can hit the tip of my finger. But when I'm back here, I'm back to the adapted location. Who's following that? Okay? So the idea is we're hitting fresh neural tissue when we change our eye movement, and we're going back to the adapted fatigue neural tissue when we go back to the fatiguing. So this follows retinal coordinates very tightly. And remember that a particular patch on your retina is driving a very specific bunch of cells inside of the LGN, and that in turn is driving a very specific bunch of cells back here in your primary visual cortex. We call this a retinotopic organization. Right? A particular group of cells in the LGN survey a particular bunch of photoreceptors on, on the retina. Just like you, we have 435 or whatever that number is of, uh, of representatives. One of them is dedicated to Licking County. Right? A different senator or a different representative is dedicated to a different county right? or a, a different district anyway. It's kind of like your LGN cells are surveying a particular district filled with photoreceptors. All the way back here, a particular set of V1 brain cells will be surveying a particular district in the LGN, just as LGN is surveying the retina. Okay? So we get this retinotopic adaptation that we can see just by saying, okay, move your eyes up, move them down, move them all the way down, and move them back to the center. And you can see that you've really adapted a very specific subset of your neurons. Who's following that? Does that work? I, mean, I think it's really cool. I think it's very elegant also. Okay. Any questions or comments on, on any of that? Okay. Just to maybe draw something that will help us. I'm going to turn the lights back on, so beware. Some people <clears throat> are sensitive to the increase in light. Sorry about all that. Very crudely, we can say something like this. On this axis, we'll have the sensitivity of different neurons that are tuned to various wavelengths. And we'll say that we get something like this, something like this. And here is our lambda, and here's the very long wavelengths. Here are the shorter wavelengths, something like 400 to, to 700. Right? I'm going to call this area very crudely green, and this area very crudely red. Okay? Early on, I might show you a stimulus that is you know, right here. And so we have, at that particular wavelength, we have equal sensitivity from this mechanism, which is maximally sensitive to what I will crudely call green light. And we're getting a similar level of response from this second mechanism, which is maximally sensitive to a longer wavelength that I'll, that I'll call red. Who's following that so far? Okay. Then I have you stare at that thing for 30 seconds in a row, and maybe it's the case that there's something you know, um, long wave-ish over on that side, so it's going to hit my, my retina over here, and we're going to begin to reduce the sensitivity of this long wave mechanism, bringing it way down here. It doesn't go all the way down to zero, but it goes down most of the way. So this guy's come down from here to here. Its sensitivity has been reduced because we've had prolonged exposure and those cells fatigue. Who's following that much so far? Does that work? Okay. Then I bring back the stimulus, and you might now notice that at the same stimulus point, I'm still intercepting the green guy right over here, this mechanism that's maximally tuned to that. But at the same time now, after adaptation, I'm getting a much lower level of, if you will, red firing. People seeing that? So at time two, the green mechanism's response is greatly exceeding the red mechanism's response, but that's only true after adaptation. When I started out this ball game and, and presented this just at the very first instant, those two mechanisms were equally sensitive. <laughs> so what happens then is you get something like a green after effect, right? because after you've been adapting, this mechanism is firing more saliently than is that mechanism. So it's suggesting to you that you've got something out there that might be more green than red even though it's actually positioned here physically okay, at a neutral point between those two. Yes, please. So that straight line is the criterion? Uh, so we wouldn't call that a criterion. That's just the position of the stimulus. Okay? So the stimulus can be relatively short wave light. It can be relatively long wave light. I've picked a light here that's right in between those two. Okay? And early on, we respond equally to it. After adaptation, because we adapted this guy down, the green mechanism is firing more than the red mechanism, and your psychological experience is that you're experiencing green. Okay? Even though what's physically out there hasn't changed. We've changed not the stimulus, the distal stimulus, we've changed instead the state of your nervous system through adaptation. Please go ahead. Uh, I just don't understand why the green is firing. Okay, let's try maybe one more. So same idea, right? I'm just going to draw the same thing over here. Okay, Here's my sensitivity. Here's my wavelength. I'm drawing the same graph. Here's green. 
here's red, okay? I can draw this kind of like that, and I've got maybe this going on here, okay? And does that help if we unpack it a little bit? Here's that light, right, okay? And here, this guy is firing at that level. You can think of sensitivity as the number of action potentials, okay? That's a big number. That's a smaller number. Does that work? Okay. So this, and this one is the green mechanism. The green one is firing more than the red one is after this adapt, uh, adapted state has taken over. Yeah. Yes, please. So could it go the other way? Oh, absolutely. Uh, here I'm only developing one case where we were adapting to, say, this guy. <laughs> okay. I'm drawing an example. And then that gave us what we were calling something like a green after effect. Where does that green after effect come from? Well, there's more green firing than red firing here, right? Okay. But I could have played the ball game the other way around. I could have adapted this guy down, left this guy up where he was, okay, and then red is going to overpower green. And then adapting the triangle? Uh, the triangle is in green, yeah, right, that would, right, okay. So you should get something on the pinkish side because this guy would be firing more than that guy. Does that work for us? This is how all adaptation after effects work. Okay. We can do this in temperature. Have you done that in second or third grade? You stick your hand in really hot water for a little while and then you put it in lukewarm water and it feels very cold or vice versa, okay? You can have hot and cold receptors that are normally firing equally. You adapt one of those down and then the after effect is that the one that was not adapted is going to be overpowering the one that had been adapted. Right? Okay? So it, could be in, it can be in color, it can be in tilt, it can be in size, it can be in temperature, uh, it can be in uh, auditory frequency or wavelength, right? This is just a general um, adaptation effect. Okay? Uh, relatively fundamental principle of our, uh, of our nervous system. Okay. We'll try one more. We'll try one more example. We'll see if we can get this one going. You probably have seen that for two or three days I've been trying to get us to a spiral after effect. And I've not actually used this particular website. So let me see if I can call up the website and we'll see if we get an effect. We're going to have you adapt for about 30 seconds to a spiral stimulus. And then we'll have you look at my nose and see if my nose goes out of formation. So let's see if I can center that reasonably well. Is that, that's a pretty good size stimulus, right? Okay. Can you keep your eye right about here? I'll go for 30 seconds. And you can blink as you need to blink, but if you can keep your fixation toward the center, Do about five more seconds, keeping your eyes there. Okay, if you now look at my nose, now you have to tell me what you're experiencing because I actually haven't done this one yet. <laughs> What's going on? You're smiling. I'm, I'm, you're smiling. I'm spiraling. Is my and it might even be because you have different uh, you have different directions there. Like, my, like I, I became very concave or convex or something, like I, I kind of expanded, okay, right? So exactly the same diagram, I can turn this up, okay? But now what I can tell you is inside of an area of your brain that we haven't gotten to yet, the medial superior temporal area, there are cells that are tuned either to clockwise motion, that's when they start firing, and other cells are tuned to counterclockwise motion, which I'll call clockwise and anti-clockwise because clockwise and anti-clockwise start with different letters, okay? So now what we do is we go over to here and we play exactly the same game but instead of talking about color-based features, red and green, as next by wavelength, we'll talk about clockwise and anti-clockwise, where this now becomes direction. Okay, so you have some cells in area MST, medial superior temporal lobe, okay, that are going to be tuned to clockwise motion. These are to anti, okay, and this is motion direction. Same thing over here, right? clockwise and anti. And at some point, let's say that you, in the center there, I don't even know which direction we have, but let's just say that you have been adapting to anti-clockwise motion. Relatively speaking, those cells will become fatigued. 
for a given retinal location, everything is retinotopic. Right? We, we, we preserve retinotopy all the way through to the cortex, and even if you synapses past the visual cortex to area MST, those cells become fatigued, and you'll get something like a counterclockwise expansion. <clears throat> People okay with that? Is that working for us? Okay. So the general principle uh, of uh, lateral inhibition is working throughout our nervous system all the time, and really all of our senses. Okay. Real good. Any questions on, on any of that? Okay. Why don't we go back in to where we left off before Rachel came in. This is our second Rachel. Rachel Fenton came in to join us. And we were right about here in trichromatic vision. And we had, oops, excuse me. I've opened up 10.2. That's the one that I wanted. Not 10.7. Okay. We had done Dalton, and we had also had some conversation about these different graphs. So I'm going to put those away just for a moment and say, um, by way of review, can we all yell out what are the three major dimensions along which colors can vary from each other? Hue, saturation, and, and brightness. Okay? So we have a lot of these graphs, and we might ask you to draw these graphs on, a, on an exam. And on the y-axis, we have something like the number of photons. And on this axis, we might have something like wavelength that goes from 400 to 700 nanometers. And we, we abbreviate wavelength with lambda. Okay? Okay, so, so we've got that going on. Can you draw in the air how red is different from blue? So I'll give you the axes in the air. Right? Here is the number of photons. Here's the wavelength. Can you draw in the air where, where red is and where blue is? Okay, <laughs> I like the way, yeah, okay, there, there you go. Claudio's got it, okay. <laughs> yeah. And which was which? Oh, red and blue. Red and blue, okay, did it with two fingers, that works, okay. Or you could have gone like this, something, okay. So that's how red differs from blue. Hues are distinguished primarily by their, their location on that axis, okay. And that's probably the easiest one to think about, okay. Hue, uh, let's go to saturation. And the example that we typically give here is how do we distinguish red from pink? Okay, using saturation. So can we have the same imaginary, imaginary air-drawn axes? Here's the number of photons. Here's the wavelength. Okay, can you show me somehow by drawing in the air how you go from red to pink? <laughs> Claire's got it. Okay, all right. Abby's got it. What are you doing there, Abby? <laughs> oh, broadband. Okay, thank you for using that phrase. I don't, I'm not sure I'd used it today, but um, I'm really glad that we did because we do want to talk about having narrower bands or broader bands, a, a narrower range of frequencies or a broader range of frequencies or wavelengths. Okay, uh, and so we are going to get something that's a little bit whiter. Uh, and to get that, we have to have a, a broader range of, of wavelengths or a broader range equivalently of frequencies. Okay? So we did hue as two different locations, and we can put this kind of a thing over to show red versus pink. That's hue, saturation, and brightness is our last one. Okay? Does anybody remember the two colors that we contrasted with each other there? Red and maroon, okay, and can we draw that in the air? Here's your number of photons, here's your wavelength. Okay, look at Alexa's got it. Okay, she's, she's doing something like that or, yeah, something. Okay, All right, so here's the, the brighter one, here's the dimmer one, okay? So we're at the same location, same width, but now it's the height of this, where brightness is actually defined as the perceptual correlate of intensity. And intensity is the number of photons, okay? Brightness is the perceptual correlate of, of intensity, and uh, so we have fewer photons, it's less bright, and as we begin to dial that down, we get a, um, a darker red, and at some point we start calling it maroon. So it's fun to think about how on a given very simple graph we can begin to describe these three different dimensions. Okay. All right, that works really, really well. Let's talk a little bit more about that, that PowerPoint. That was the one from 10.2, and so we've made it all the way through here. I always like to ask my students about this one. I, this, I think, is pretty cool. So here's what we've got, the relative energy, right? You can think of this, again, as like the number of photons. And here's our favorite axis that goes from 400 to 700. We've done that a couple of times today. If we think about the quote-unquote white light that's coming through this, these windows, its spectrum is going to look something like this. Okay? Interestingly, it does change mildly over the day. So let's say we're, we've got a pretty good sun out in the morning, and the sun stays out all, the, all day long till maybe at this time of year, 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. Does anybody know how the sunlight changes ever so slightly over the day? Does anybody know how? Yeah. 
the atmosphere start to get in the way and it blocks out the blues and the violets. Wow, okay, so the light is refracted differently depending on how, um, uh, where we are relative to the sun in, in, its, in its, daily, um, its daily cycle. And so we do get more blocking of the blues, and so we get a little bit more long wavelength light over here in the afternoon than we do in the morning. And Professor Tom Schultz, if you've ever taken a biology class with him, can tell you all about how insects respond to that. There are some insects that are predominantly colored blue or predominantly colored red, and those different animals are going to be doing their thing either in the morning for the blue team or in the afternoon for the red team, uh, based on ever so slight but measurable changes in how much energy you're getting out this way toward the long end versus this way to the long end. It's just something about how light is refracted differently, of course, uh, uh, across the day, which I, I think is really, really interesting. But it looks white to me subjectively. Maybe it looks like white light to you also subjectively. And then we can also say if we had a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, what would that look like? Well, it looks whitish, but it actually has a different spectrum. And Meg has a question. Um, just to back up, I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. the brightness is the what correlate? The perceptual correlate, okay? So a brightness is a perceptual phenomenon, okay? Remember that we have psychophysics. So we're psychologists here, even though it doesn't always feel like it, because we talk a lot about biology and a lot about physics. We are psychologists. We want to know the perceptual correlate. What color are you experiencing subjectively? A pastel. You're getting, uh, my nose is exploding on you because you, you've been adapted. What's going on perceptually versus what's going on physically? The, the physical uh, change there is intensity along this axis. Right? Right? And then brightness is the correlate of that. Okay. So interestingly, you know, these lights and lots of incandescent lights look white to us, sunlight looks white to us, but they actually have different spectra. So here's the question I ask about, because uh, we have you know, 17 or so students in this room, and you might, we might have some roommates here, but we probably uh, don't have that many roommates here. Some of you will have a roommate or a friend who has these specialized lights that you can buy that are uh, attempts to capture the, one, the, the sun spectrum. Has anybody seen those lights? Right? And, and you've been under them? Some people find them very relaxing, and, and they, they find them uh, rejuvenating and so forth. Some folks who struggle with a seasonal affective disorder find them to be helpful, right, to be under lights like that. So it's cool that we live in a day and age where we can actually not only get light anytime we want, but we can actually specify the range of light that we uh, get. I'll try not to take too much of a digression because we're already a little bit behind, but this <coughs> the day before yesterday, I was all day at a conference in, at OSU on neuroscience, and they were talking about the harms that are happening to you and me as we are exposed, you know, after dark hours to a lot of blue light especially, so light that's down here at this end. Uh, we have another kind of opsin in our eyes. We've talked about road opsin. We've talked about cone opsin for rods and cones. There's another one called melanopsin. Who's heard of that? Maybe you've heard of melanopsin. We haven't talked about melanopsin. Okay. Well, there's, there's another um, type of photoreceptor there, maximally sensitive to this. It doesn't do anything for us with respect to vision. What it does do, though, is it drives our internal clock with respect to circadian rhythms. Okay. And for most of the planet's history, and certainly most of human's history, when the sun went down, game over. <laughs> Didn't give up until the next day. He had a little bit of moonlight, but that was predominantly it. Okay? But now, in the last 150-ish years, we turn on all kinds of lights, okay? including a lot of uh, handheld devices that have a very, very strong peak right about here, interestingly enough. Okay? And that's where our melanopsin is maximally sensitive. So when you're watching a video, late at night, it might even be one of my videos on your, on your, your screen, right? You're nailing your eye, unbeknownst to you, with a lot of blue light, if I can call it that, that is being absorbed by your melanopsin, and you're basically saying to your, your visual system and to your uh, entire brain, it's not time to go to sleep yet, there's plenty of sunlight out there, right? Had you been alive 200 years ago, right, this would have this would not be happening. You wouldn't be watching this stuff all, all day, every day. So anyway, some of the neuroscientists were talking about the health consequences of that. It was amazing stuff. It turned out to predict sleep cycles. It was predicting BMI, body mass index. All kinds of things get reset by this uh, melanopsin. And, and what's weird is all the while it feels fairly whitish to us, right? But we can see that that is physically different from that. This other one that we're talking about is physically different again. It always feels like white light, okay? But if you do... Um, a spec I have my spectrometer with me today. Maybe we'll get to a measurement, maybe we won't. Um, you'll see that we have actually different wavelengths out there. Okay, who's all right with all that? Okay, we have time for a couple more demos. This is a pretty good demo day. I'll take this down one more time. I apologize for 
the dimness of this. Ah. Okay. And I, and of course, we have a bright, sunshiny day, so I'm not, I'm not getting good contrast. Can anybody see that there is, this is reddish? Or is that not really coming out? And there's a green patch here. Okay. And then we lose all of that over there. Right? So the idea is that color makes objects conspicuous. Right? So the, the same number of photons will be coming off of here and here, but they're in different positions on the spectrum. And because we have wavelength sensitivity, we can pick that up over here. We still capture the same number of photons here and here, but we take away the wavelength information, and that patch is gone. Okay? So um, color can make objects conspicuous. Okay? And I'd love to do this every time around. Uh, if you think you see the object in here, can you raise your hand? And if not, just keep your hand down. Please don't call out the object. There is something embedded in here. are not getting that. You don't, you don't see any particular eye, okay? How people think they've got something? Think you've got something? Okay, Abby, can you help us out? With what do you think you see? Like a tree and a river? Like a tree and a river. Water. Okay, well, I, I, th I think it's a tree. I think I'll go that far. And uh, there's a body of water. Is there something else? Maybe not a body of water. Yeah, do you see something? Oh, yeah, I wasn't sure if that was a hand or not. Oh, I almost see a person. Do you, okay, where do you think you see a person? Okay, so there's a little ledge here, and there is a hunter standing on that ledge facing this way. He's wearing camo, okay, and that says camouflage leg. Can, can, can anybody pick that out? Yeah? Okay. All right. He's pretty well camouflaged, and, you know, he's trying to hide from a deer who's probably a dichromat. Right? Deers are probably dichromat. They're mammals, and most mammals are dichromats. I don't know if this is better or worse. If we go to this guy, the same picture we've just taken out, the chromaticity, right? Now can you see... There's the ledge, there's his boot. Just right there is his boot, and that's his leg. Maybe that's worse, maybe that's better. What do you think? Pretty well camouflaged? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so colors can make objects conspicuous. Colors can make objects inconspicuous, okay? Pretty neat, pretty neat. <laughs> okay. Color metamers. Uh, let's take, okay, we have a moment to do this. So I promised that we would uh, use these today. Why don't we take uh, a moment to do some of those demos? Would you join me in doing it this way? I'll grab one of these with you. Can you put the red side up top? We're going to hold it vertically. So red way up top, blue is underneath. Okay? And I call them red and blue. That's vulgar, right? This is long wave, that's short wave physically. Psychologically, they're red and blue, but long wave and short. And we might think about this, that all this white light is coming through this window and hitting this filter, and only the long wave ones are passing through. Okay, so what's landing on my retina through that red filter is the longer wave light, and what's landing on my retina through that blue filter is the shorter wave light. So we have a long wave pass, that's red, and we have a short wave pass, right? Only the short waves can make their way around. Who's following that? That we're, okay. it's, it's fun to talk about in a filter which ones are passing. Other filters that we've had, sometimes they would allow this orientation, this plane of polarization to pass, but not that one. Right? This time, we're blocking on the basis of wavelength, and we're letting some to pass and others not to pass. Okay, so um, let's see if we can have first, without any of this, um, oh, let's, let's have you put this over. So cover your left eye, and then have the red one over your right eye. We'll do right on red. Okay. Here's right on red. Okay, so I'll try not to lead the witness. You can tell me what you're experiencing. There are three bars there. Anybody want to try to describe these? Okay, thanks, Abby. Uh, the one that's like greenish, the little one's kind of like orange color. Okay. Okay, which uh, of these three, let's, let's call them A, B, and C, through your red filter, which two are most similar to each other? B and C, okay. Now, why don't you just uh, squeeze it on up and have, look through the blue filter. So we're still on B and C, most similar to each other? No, okay, let's go back to the other one, just make sure we didn't get that wrong. Over there. Okay, so which are, uh, using the red filter, 
Are we agreed it's B and C are most similar? Yes. And then let's go back to the blue filter. Which ones are most similar now? A and B. A and B. Okay, all right. And we can open our eyes and check it all out. Okay, so that's what's on the screen the whole time. Right? What's cool about this is these give us some insight as to what's really out there. Okay? So what's, what I think is really neat is, as I think I mentioned on the video, we actually do have, coming out of that projector, three guns, right? One is a red gun, to use the vulgar, one is a green gun, and one is a blue gun, right? Where's the yellow gun? There is no yellow gun. There's R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. Who's okay with that? Okay. What color would you call this? Now, is that, uh, hopefully that's a pretty good yellow, right? Maybe not as good as the yellow that I had on my shirt, but that's about it, the best yellow that I can make. So we can ask, where does that yellow come from? Okay? And we can use our filters to begin telling us that. If we hold this long wave filter over here, we could say, well, we're getting something quite similar in the center as we have on the far right. Okay? When we allow only long waves to pass, we can see that the B and C stimuli look very similar to each other. And as far as I could make them, they were identical. They might not really be identical because that projector isn't perfect, but uh, they're as identical as I can make them. Okay? And then if we go to the other filter, we can see that, aha, inside of that yellow, we also have a green component. Okay? So what's here is here, and what's here is here, but we can filter them out by using this. Okay? So weirdly, and I think many students find very counterintuitively, this yellow is actually red and green. And it doesn't work like that with paint, right? If I take red paint and yellow paint and I put them, uh, sorry, red paint and green paint and I put them together, I really don't get a yellow. And I get something, something very different than that. But if I take lights and I put red and green together, I get this yellow. Right? So there's, there's nothing out there that is a 590 nanometer stimulus like the, the yellow shirt that I was wearing the other day. But we're fooling your system into thinking that it's getting a yellow, okay? And this is the idea of metamers. So let's see if we can get to that description. When I was wearing my bright yellow shirt the other day, if you could take this photometer and measure the wavelength, it would be at 590. Okay? Then if you take a picture of me on my, wearing my yellow shirt and you project it through that, remember that that has a red, green, and blue gun. It doesn't have a yellow gun. It doesn't have 590 nanometers. So how come it looks yellow? Right? How come Big Bird on Sesame Street looks yellow if your TV set has only R, G, and B? And the answer is that we fool your system into seeing yellow by stimulating you with green light and red light visible through these respectively. Okay? Pretty cool. So these are physically different from this, yet they're perceptually indistinguishable. They're said to be metamers. Who remembers that little ditty from the, the video? Okay. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay, why don't we end that there? I did want to do one more thing before... Um, before our session on Wednesday. And as I wanted to give you the last eight or seven minutes here, I'm gonna turn the lights back up again, so bear with me. You might close your eyes and then ooze them open if that, if that helps you. Okay. I wanted to get some feedback on TED-Ed. I want to see how people are enjoying that or not enjoying that. So I'm going to ask you to think about not a particular TED-Ed question and not a particular TED-Ed lesson, but we've had about five weeks of TED-Eds, okay? And I'm going to ask you to respond without putting your name on top, without putting your Slater box on top, uh, to fill in the following. The first question is, what I like about how we're using TED-Ed in this class is that, and then you can tell me what's, what's working for TED-Ed and you. Second question, our use of TED-Ed in this class could be improved if blank, 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 and you can fill that in. And then the third one is, anything else you want to tell me about how we're using TED-Ed here? Um, you are the first S&P class to be using TED-Ed, and I, before we get to the second two-thirds of the semester, we're about a third of the way through, I thought I'd get some feedback from you. So if you please take one and pass it. I have a few folks, as I've mentioned before, who are in my stats class where we're also using TED-Ed. For that handful of students, if you would please, you'll take one and pass. Sorry, I've got only one there. If you would please restrict your answer to how we're using it in this class. I've got more coming around. Thanks. I've got extras. Does everybody have one? Thank you. Thank you for the extras, Gabby. Okay. So please, no names, no Slater boxes. I appreciate your honesty. What's working, what isn't working. When you're done, a face down, you can place those face down here and we're 
finished for the day. And just a reminder that for Wednesday, we have our final TED-Ed before the, before the exam. Um, 